It's a cookbook app. It's on your iPad. It's got videos. It's got recipes. It sends the recipe to your phone so you have a shopping list. It's cheaper than a regular cookbook, you know? It only costs 10 euros. What do you think? You know, what do you think your mom says? She goes, oh, it's amazing. You're so smart. You're so innovative. Why hasn't someone done this before? So then you go off, you know, you build it, you spend all your savings, and you launch it, and you go, I launched it. And you're looking at the sales figures, and like zero people have bought it. So you go back to your mom, and you're like, mom, that number should be at least one. Why didn't you buy my app? And she goes, ah, I don't need another cookbook. And you go, why didn't you tell me that? She goes, well, it didn't want to hurt your feelings. You seem so excited. And so we blame her. We're like, no, people should be honest to us. But that's not true. Because what happened is you ask bad questions. And when you ask bad questions, you get bad data, right? So that falls entirely on you as the entrepreneur. Um, you know, you run a focus group, you ask bad questions, you get bad results, right? You, you send out a survey, you get bad data. Uh, and then all you're doing is you're collecting more and more bad data, which makes you more confident, but it doesn't make you smarter. It's like giving an encouraging pep talk to a drunk driver. They get more confident, but they don't get better. And, and so you end up more confidently spending your money and making bad mistakes. So there's an easy solution, and if we have that same conversation with our mom, but instead of pitching our idea, we ask about her life, we get a very different result. So if we say, hey mom, weird question, I know, but I see there's a bunch of cookbooks on your shelf. When's the last time you bought a new one? She goes, oh, I haven't bought a cookbook in years. You know, I know all my favorite recipes. Why would I need another cookbook? I'm like, well, that disproves our idea. You know, but maybe we push. You know, but hey, some of those look newer than others, right? I see some of those don't look as beat up. He goes, ah, actually, I did buy a vegetarian cookbook about three months ago. Now, I was trying to eat more healthy, and I couldn't figure out how to make my veggies interesting. We go, ooh, that's interesting. She said she never buys these things, but actually for niche recipes. So we go, okay, maybe we don't need every recipe. Maybe we focus on these little clusters, you know, Mexican food and vegetarian recipes and Atkins diet. So by just not mentioning our idea and talking about her life, we are already getting more useful information. And she doesn't know she can hurt our feelings, so she has no reason to be dishonest, right? Um, the best thing you can do learning from customers is just don't tell them about your idea. Instead, just ask about their life. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the foundation. Um, and this brings into uh, some of like the general thinking about tech startups. Does anyone know what kills more technology startups than anything else? Do you want to shout out a guess? A team, bad idea, run out of money. People that don't buy their stuff. Yeah, people don't buy their stuff. All of these things are bad, right? But they're not fatal. Like if you start with a bad team, well, maybe you change some people, but you can get there eventually, right? Uh, if you start out with a bad idea, very common, every startup starts out with a bad idea. Unless you get incredibly lucky, like Dropbox. They started with the right idea, and if you can do that, it's good. Uh, but most of us aren't that lucky. Most of us start with bad ideas. And then over time, we improve them. We make them better, right? Uh, and we do that by figuring out, like, okay, usage is zero. Why is that? My analytics are terrible. Everyone hates me. Like, why do they hate me? How can I improve this? Um, but none of those problems kill you. You can get through them. Uh, if you're a group of university students working out of your apartment, sitting in the couch, you know, or you're working out of coffee shops, and you launch completely the wrong product, it's a terrible idea. Everyone hates it. You've marketed it the wrong way. You've built the wrong features. That's embarrassing, but does it put you out of business? Not really, because university students, in a business sense, are immortal. They have no expenses, therefore they can't be killed. They make a mistake, they go, whoops, that was wrong, and then they try again with the lessons they've learned. And the next one's better, and the next one's better. And this is the idea of iteration. Um, but when a big company tries this, they go, okay, we have the wrong idea, blah, 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 let's spend 10 million on advertising it. You know? We're gonna brute force this wrong idea down people's throats. You know? Oh, our team's so big, we need to hire managers, we need to get a fancy office. And startups make this mistake too, especially if they raise too much money. They start acting like a big company. And if you've just done a million dollar ad campaign and you launched the wrong idea, what happens to your company then? Super bad stuff, you know? You're not just embarrassed, you're very out of business. Um, 
And this is actually like the root cause of most tech startup failure. There's a report on this uh, called the Startup Genome Project a few years back. And almost every other mistake you can make on launching a product or building a company is forgivable if your expenses are still low enough. This is the beauty of being a small company, a new company. You're immortal. Your mistakes are free. It's only once you start acting like a big company that your mistakes become expensive. That's when you only get one shot. That's when your mistakes hurt. Uh, so part of learning from customers is accepting that your early attempts are probably going to be wrong, and that's okay, and it's part of the process. Uh, and if you can keep the team or the company small and cheap and thrifty, if you can work out of cafes instead of a fancy office, uh, you're able to make these mistakes a lot more cheaply uh, and get further. And premature scale basically means focusing on the wrong stuff at the wrong time. So when we first start a company, or we're first building a product, we're trying to figure out, like, am I even focusing on a problem people care about? Does anyone care at all about what I'm doing? You know, do budgets exist for this? Is there a market? Does anyone care? These are very open-ended questions that have nothing to do with your idea, and they have everything to do with your customers. And people go, okay, you're annoying, you're awesome. Uh, and then they go, yes, validated. They run out and they build a stupid idea, and then they're like, why don't we go out of business? We talk to our customers. It's like, yeah, well, you kind of force them. It's like, if you go to a bar and you're annoying enough, you can always get a fake phone number. <laughs> but that's not progress, right? You're like giving yourself bad data. Don't do that. Um, then after you understand your customers pretty well, you come up with a specific product idea, and you confirm that, like, does it have the right features? Is it at the right price point? Are people actually going to use this, or do they just think they want it? Um, these are the more analytics questions. These are the more, like, salesy questions. Um, and then after that, you're like, I understand my customers. I'm pretty sure the prototype is good for them. They want it. Uh, then you start focusing on the growth stuff. And the mistake people make is they focus on growth too soon, because that's where your expenses really start building up. Like, developing a prototype is cheap, but doing a big global ad campaign is super expensive. Um, and the reason we jump to growth is because of our egos. Um, like, when I tell someone I run a business, the first question they ask me every time, 100%, is how many employees do you have? And what that is, if you're just starting out, is that's pressure from everyone around you to grow faster. And if you're not ready, if you don't understand your customers yet, or you don't, they, they don't like the prototype yet, what everyone around you, including your loved ones, is trying to do is kill your company by increasing your expenses. So you have to have this like resistance to the social pressure that, like, I have one employee, and that's awesome, because we're able to make our mistakes right now. And that's going to give us the time to figure out if people really like it. And if they do like it, we're going to build 100 million of them and scale infinitely. And then you're going to go, well, they got lucky. You know? So, like, you got to be aware. Like, other people try to trick you into this premature scale. Um, so, to get the foundations right, talking to customers is really helpful. Um, but it's easy to mess up. Our goal is basically to figure out if people are going to pay for our product before we finish building it. Now, there's different ways of figuring out if people want to pay for a product. Uh, like, if you're building something physical, you can just put it on Kickstarter. I launched a board game, I put it on Kickstarter. That's an easy solution, right? Because you haven't finished building it, you haven't done the expensive part of manufacturing, and you still get perfect information about whether or not people want to pay you. That's great. But it's not possible for every product. Uh, like, it's hard to kickstart a phone app. It's hard to kickstart a service business. Uh, and so what do we do in these, these problem spaces where we have a long, expensive research and development process? and we're not necessarily just able to kickstart it. How do we figure out then if the research and development's worth it? Um, there's a couple of mistakes that everyone makes, uh, including, and in some ways especially, experienced salespeople. Um, the first one I've already talked about, the kind of intro story, the idea is that whenever you pitch your idea, what you get in return is not data. Whenever you pitch your idea, you get opinions and you get compliments. It's obvious why compliments are useless, but opinions are a little bit trickier. Let's say you pitch your idea to someone and you go, that's stupid, it'll never work, I hate it, I hate you, I extension. <laughs> you leave that meeting feeling bad, but does it matter? I would argue it does not matter, even if they are a supreme expert in the industry. Uh, in the startup world, you've got venture capitalists who invest in, and thus bet on, ideas. They are the most experienced and the most qualified in the world at predicting startup success. 
and their success rate is about one in five. If the best in the world fails 80% of the time with their opinion, that they're putting their money behind, how seriously are you gonna take anyone's opinion? All of you guys can tell me my idea is stupid, I'll walk out of here, drink a beer, not care at all. Because that's an opinion, it's not real data. But if my customers' actions show me that they're not gonna use my product, even one of them, I take that extremely seriously. Um, um, and any of these questions, like do you think, do you like, would you ever, their opinions, their hypotheticals, they're in the future, they lead to very bad data. Um, so a bad question is something like, do you think it's a good idea? And a good question is like, how do you currently deal with this? The first question is about your ego, it's about your pitch. The second question is about their life. To get truth, to get real data, you wanna ask about your customers' lives, not about their opinions of your idea. Um, so yeah, bad questions are compliments and opinions, good questions are facts about their life. And this is what I call the mom test, because if you ask questions like this, even your mom can't lie to you. So good questions, pass the mom test. Um, at a certain point, you do have to show people your product, and obviously that introduces a bunch of new biases. Because I just told you, if you tell people about your product, they lie to you. So how do you deal with this? Uh, and the solution is pretty simple. If I go to you guys and I go, hey, guys, I got a great idea. Thank you for all being here. Listen to my pitch. Business casual flip-flops, right? <laughs> Wear these to the office. They're gonna be stylish business flip-flops. You know, you live in a hot climate, you need these. You're gonna go, wow, Rob, that's so innovative. You're such a smart guy. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know, thank you, thank you. And you go, I've never seen the business flip-flops before. And I go, I know, I'm creating a brand new thing. It's never been done. And you go, oh, it's, well, let me know when it launches. I'd love to see it. And, and, and I'm like, nice. And I leave there, and in my head, I'm thinking, they loved it, right? They told me I was innovative. They told me it's never been done before. That must mean it's a good idea, right? Like, beds that electrocute you has never been done before, but that doesn't make it a good idea, right? Uh, there's maybe a reason it hasn't been done before. And, and so, how do I get around this bias and, and like figure it out? Well, all I have to do is ask you for something you care about. If I go flip-flops, you go awesome, innovative, I go, hey, they're not ready yet. We're gonna manufacture them pretty soon. They're gonna cost 25 euros, but you can reserve as many pairs as you want for a five euro deposit. How many do you need? And you go, I don't need any right now, but like, awesome product. <laughs> I go, nice, thank you. And I leave, and then I ignore your feedback completely because you're not a customer. And if no one wants to give me any sort of commitments, I probably change my product. Because if people really care, they'll give you something in advance. It's not always a pre-order. Um, and I think of these as the meetings that go nowhere. You pitch your product and you leave with nothing but a compliment. That's a problem. Uh, and it normally comes in the format. You can look out for it. It's a compliment plus a stalling tactic. So it goes, that's really innovative. Let me know when it launches. Compliment stalling tactic. Wow, that's so cool. I've never seen that before. Shoot me an email when the bait is out and I can try it. Compliment stalling tactic. What they've done is they've made you feel good and then committed nothing, right? They've ended the meeting in the most polite way possible without giving you a thing. Uh, and you leave, and the reason this is so dangerous is you believe that they're gonna buy it. So it's your job to like to qualify them, to figure out are they gonna buy it, are they gonna use it, or was that just a compliment to solve? So all you have to do is ask them for something. Uh, the stuff you can ask for is time, reputation, and money. So time is like a clear next meeting, or even better yet, time with their other people on their team. So let's say you're building a product for you know agencies or developers, and the person who runs the agency goes, it's amazing, I love it. I actually had this meeting, uh, and I was like, okay, she said she loves it, but how do I know if she's serious? My product isn't ready to ask for money, so I'll ask for time. So I said, hey, uh, we're not ready yet, but can I come in next week and sit down with your development team? It'll take about four hours, but we'll be, get, we'll be able to go through all the product specs and make sure this really solves your problem. And suddenly the whole dynamic of the meeting changed, and she goes, wait, hold on, and she starts seriously thinking, because this was the first time in the meeting I'd actually asked her for something she cares about. She's not gonna give me her developer's time lightly, right? She's only gonna give me that if she really wants what I'm selling. Uh, and after like a minute, the super long pause, she goes, actually this is really important to us. When can you come in? And at that point, I take her feedback so seriously because she's given me something of value, so I know she's a potential customer. She might not buy it, but she's definitely like serious, right? Um, 
Oh, and the the natural flow at first when you're early in the product development, you can only get away with like asking for time, and then as it's a bit more mature, you can ask for reputation, which is usually introductions to people's like bosses, lawyers, whoever, someone they don't want to give you an introduction to, uh, and if they do, you know that they care. Uh, other types of reputation, public case study, public testimonial, that sort of stuff, uh, and money is the normal, you know, letter of intent, deposit, pre-order. Uh, and as you develop the product to make it better, you're just asking for stuff to try to figure out if you're on the right track. And over time, that turns into money, and you're like, whoa, I just made my first sale. And that was kind of how I did the journey from being a developer to a salesperson. I wasn't trying to sell stuff. I was trying to figure out if people care. The only way to figure out if they care is to ask them for something they care about. Uh, and soon I was like, I'm like, good news, guys. He gave me 20 grand. I guess he's pretty serious. And then I was like, wait, he gave me 20 grand. I'm a sales guy. And then I went and cried. <laughs> so people are like, sounds like a great idea. You always get this stuff at the end of your pitch. Just push one level through and ask them for something afterwards. And suddenly, you know, hey, I love it. Would you be willing to try it out for a couple of weeks and be in a public case study? Um, sign a letter of intent. It tells you who's serious. And you're not trying to be pushy. Again, it's like the fake number in the bar. Uh, if you're pushy, you can get a fake number, but that's not useful. All you're trying to do is figure out like how serious are they. You're trying to qualify, not convince. Because um, you want to make sure you're talking to the right people, because during product development, time is a very precious resource, especially when you're a small team. So you want to spend it on the, the, the customers who are, who are serious. Um, and that's related to the, the final point, the final mistake, which is wasting time. Uh, learning what a customer cares about does not take uh, an hour. But meetings are only scheduled in hour-long blocks. <laughs> You know, like let's say you were building a product for agencies, and you're like, you meet someone at this event, you go, oh, you run an agency, I would love to have a meeting with you. You exchange business cards, and you do the calendar dance, and you commute to go see them. Next thing you know, you spent six hours on this meeting. You know? Why didn't you just ask them what they cared about now over a coffee or a beer? It takes like five minutes to understand what a customer cares about. Like the whole meeting thing is just a bunch of overhead and formality that you don't really need. Um, all this stuff, focus groups, surveys, blah, blah, blah. It's stupid because it's formality that gets in the way of what you're actually trying to do, which is learn how does my customer make decisions and what do they care about. Um, so a good introduce to me is like, is talking to a friend. Like if you were building a product about dating, I bet you would go out and be like, so on a scale of one to five, how much do you like online dating? That is not useful. Imagine if you were talking to a friend like that. On a scale of one to five, why do you think you get dumped so often? <laughs> That's not how friends talk to each other, right? And like the point of a friendship is understanding another human being. And that's the point of product development also, or it's not a point, but it's a prerequisite. Like if you're building a, a buying a present for your best friend, it's easy because you know what your best friend cares about. You know, you go, oh, they would find this spatula hilarious. If you're buying a, a gift for a stranger, it's really difficult because you don't know how they think and you don't know what they care about. So you go, I don't know, I'll get them a gift card. Like, when you don't understand your, your customers, you end up doing the gift card version of product design. It's like, everyone will kind of like it, but that's not enough to like, you know, make something great. Um, so yeah, I like to plan out the three big things I'm trying to learn from customers at any time, because you'd be surprised how often you bump into them. And you're just like, oh, let me ask you a question. How do you guys think of channel partnerships? And then they just tell you. Because the less formal the context, the more honest people are. If I meet you in a sales meeting and I ask you about your budget, I guarantee you're going to lie to me. Because you're like, wait, Rob's trying to trick me. He's trying to learn my budget so he can take it. <laughs> but if I meet you here over a beer and I ask you about your budget, you're going to tell me. Because we're like, yeah, this industry's hard. Let's talk about it. It's how friends talk. Um, you want to do this stuff at the same time as your product development. Uh, sometimes people go, I want to be super rigorous. I read about lean startups. So I'm going to spend three months doing nothing but talking to customers. I can guarantee you that's a waste of your time. Because you can only learn so much before you have the beginnings of a product. So you want to talk to people. That informs what you build. As soon as you've got something to show them, that lets you ask more questions. And you run these two processes at the same time. Um, so it's not meant to slow you down. It's meant to speed you up. Um, if you get just one thing right, you build a company that scales. Like Dropbox only got one thing right, but it's very right, and now they have an awesome business. Um, so all this stuff, it's like, you gotta be super paranoid about the distractions and like cut those things out of your life so that you can zoom in on one. Um, and the co-founders, it's like, you probably already have them, but if you don't, uh, and you wanna start a company someday, like find them at your job, you know? 
find an excuse to work on a weekend project with them. If you're in university, find them in your classmates. Uh, and you nurture these relationships over years. Like people too often start a company with the first co-founder they meet. Uh, but that'd be crazy. That'd be like you know marrying the first person you date. I'm not saying that could never work, but it's like statistically unlikely. And you know, with marriage, you date lots of people, and you only marry a few of them. But like with, with co-founders, we tend to marry the first person we meet. So I just say you want to shop around a bit with co-founders. Like work on hobby projects with lots of different people. Figure out who you'd like to work with, and, and you know it makes it a lot easier to get a cool company going. So thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the biggest takeaway, at least for me, is ask for commitments, not compliments, and try not to be pushy. So, since we're already a bit behind the schedule, I open the floor for questions from the audience immediately. Are there any questions for Rob? Any questions? For there, there's a question right there. That guy was first, sorry. The guy with the beard. With the beard. An entrepreneur. <laughs> 